Housing affordability and the lack of inventory continues to cripple the residential market. Now, investors, the cusp for entry into the single family market has now become even harder than it even was before. So what do you do as a residential investor and for you homeowners and end users, what do you do to get into your first single family home or upgrade into the desired home that you once dreamed of having? According to the National Association of Realtors, 2023 sold less homes historically than we have sold since 1995. Ladies and gentlemen, that is 28 years of residential dwellings selling less than what they have in prior years. And one of the biggest things is most people would sit back and say, what is the reason and source for that? And the main reason and source is the lack of inventory. That's the main source, the lack of inventory and the lack of affordability. 2023, with interest rates going from 3% all the way as high as 7%, it was a time in history where inventory and pricing outbared the market. So new people moving into the market that had never owned a home before, that are entering the market was down to 32% of homes being purchased. Now, that is down from the national average of 40% historically year over year. So an 8% cusp of new home ownership that has bottlenecked the market because of the lack of inventory and affordability. Now, understand that if we compare this to historical numbers dating back to the 1980s, the vast majority of new homeowners entering the market in the 1980s and 1990s were in their 20s. As we look at 2022, 23, and 24, and the average age of new homeowners entering the market, the average age is in their mid-30s, a decade longer to enter into your first-time homebuyers program, meaning that it's delaying the wealth that people are creating through homeownership by being able to purchase their first single-family home because of the lack of inventory. So because most homeowners now that are coming in buying homes for the first time or in their mid-30s, that's a decade difference. So there's this 10-year cusp. And here's what the, the market is actually bearing right now. There is over still 2.7 offers on every single family home that goes for sale on average that is being put in for every single dwelling that's being sold across the United States. Not only that, over 16% of all homes listed are selling for over the actual list price nationwide. So that, what that tells you that even in the cusp of the market right now, where interest rates are high, money is expensive, and things are, are not affordable at all, we're still sitting in a very viable and very thriving seller's market. So buyers, don't be alarmed. There's a solution to this, and I've been talking about it since 2019. In 2016, when we really got hot and heavy into the multifamily sector, by 2018, I realized that the lack of inventory and the cost for supply was so expensive that my dollars were more well spent buying land and building and developing than they were actually buying pre-existing inventory. Now, I know for a lot of people that sounds like an undertaking, but the reality is it's not. And the reason is, is because the variables that go is into a fix and flip are so unforeseen, ladies and gentlemen, that it is extremely hard to get the inventory and it's even harder to get it at an affordable price. Now, if you can get it at an affordable price or get it at all, your bandwidth to be able to resell it and do it at a, at a convenient price that makes sense is extremely tough in today's market. And because of those unforeseen variables, those are scarier and more unforeseen than the ground up game. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't mean that every person on this call needs to become a builder or developer or something in that regards. All I'm telling you guys is that you should be looking at new inventory, whether it's your new inventory or new inventory that somebody else's or partnering with a builder or a developer, somebody who has that experience to give you the bandwidth that you need to continue in this market. One thing that we know for sure is that we have over 7 million rooftops that we're short of right now, 5 million of which are, are in the affordable housing sector. It, when we started the building game in 1998, we didn't have this issue. Now, when we realized that this was an issue in 2016, and we really started doing some about it in 2018, we started working with people telling them, look, ladies and gentlemen, understand 
that we can't produce more existing real estate, but we can continue producing new real estate. And because there's such a cusp in the market right now of, of affordable housing and not just affordable housing, inventory in general, it gives you guys, the end users, the opportunity to generate the capital and upside on creating inventory in the market. And so one thing that I like to tell people, ladies and gentlemen, and according to the National Association of Realtors, this is going to be an ongoing issue for the next decade. And so when we create inventory, we do it specific in a really specific way. And I want to explain that to you guys right now and, and what we've been doing since 2016 to share with you guys how we've been treading through the water and migrating through these times where affordability is an issue. And so what we started doing in the multifamily sector, and you can do this on a small sector or a larger scale. Uh, we usually do it from 100 units and above, but because we understand that banking is tough and money is limited right now, one of the things that we try to do more so than anything is position ourselves where we go in and leverage smaller units in markets that are in massive need for housing, which is across the entire United States. But one of the biggest things, ladies and gentlemen, is, is knowing what market sector to be in. Because there's financial viability out there right now, and people sit back and they say, well, there's a bottleneck, there's a cuff, there's no inventory. What do I buy? How do I invest? Where do I go? And one of the biggest things is, is knowing what's available to you. And one thing that we've been doing is we've done a lot of ground up development over the course of time. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that I've, I've walked into the development sector, then out of the development sector, then into the development sector in a different industry, and then out of the development sector. And so we were heavy on single family residential homes, then retail. Then after retail, we went into, got out of retail, back into single family homes a little bit more aggressively. And then we got into multifamily. And we never left the residential single family home game because the single family residential home game has always been a need and always has been one of the, one of the only things in real estate that has actually continued to produce revenue in good times, bad times, catastrophic times, um, and it has proven the test of time. And one of the biggest reasons why is because of the lack of inventory, ladies and gentlemen. So in spite of inflation and affordability, the inventory crisis, it trumps over the affordability component. Because one thing that people need in their lives and the reason they work is for the roof over their head. And so there is a specific business model that's intended out of this. Now, there's two parts to this. And I want to explain both of, the, uh, both of them to you right now. One of them comes to the upper median, the upper, upper middle class. This is where money is generated from because the ultra wealthy don't really stimulate that money back into the economy on the residential side, um, as do the upper middle class. They're the ones that are going out spending on, on window coverings, furniture, desks, um, decor, tile, all the upgrade stuff that goes into this stuff. The upper middle class are the ones that are really producing a lot of the, um, the returns on this. So I tell people, when you go into affordable housing, you have to have a means, a means of execution on where you get your capital from. And where you get your capital from is from other people's pockets, being the middle, upper middle class. Since the upper middle class have more expendable capital, those are the ones that we focus on. Now, we, we harvest in on a specific business model to them where quality counts and supersedes over anything else. Uh, we don't give them all of the amenities that come in a, in a multi-million dollar home, but we give them one of the nicest $500,000 to $1 million homes that the market produces because all of the attributes come in the trim out items. And in the trim out items, ladies and gentlemen, are simple. And in the simplicity of the, of the, of the trim out items is a variance of a few thousand dollars, but the returns are exponential. And so one of the biggest things is knowing that quality counts in times where affordability is a challenge because people still want to spend and they still are in need, but they want to spend and they want to buy what they're in need of where they feel like they have received the best value and the best bang for their buck. So when you give them quality, they, whether they build buy your 2,500 square foot house or somebody else's, it's where the quality sits. It's not the time where you go down to Home Depot and pick up a $99 uh, Glacier Bay toilet, ladies and gentlemen. It's a time where you go in, you put just a little bit of extra into your amenities. That doesn't mean you go and spend $500 on a toilet either. That means that you have to find a threshold of reasonability where you don't strip your amenities down to the most cost-effective, lowest-end amenities that are out there 
you still give them the same amenities that you would normally give them under any normal market circumstance where affordability is not an issue. And then you give them just one notch more, just one piece more, because those are the individuals that are spending, which have a sophistication level that the average lower or lower median buyer does not have. They want to spend money, but they want to spend it on quality. And quality counts and the sophistication level of those people that are spending in that market, they know the difference between good, bad, and ugly. So don't try to fool them. Always execute with quality. Now, when that those revenues are actually brought in, where you place those revenues is what's going to depict your long-term passive income and long-term investment strategy within the affordable housing sector. We take all that capital and we deploy that capital and flush it straight into the affordable housing market sector. What we've done in the multifamily space, you can do this with fourplexes. You can do this with eight unit, 10 unit, 20 unit, 50 unit, 100 unit, or more or larger is we've stripped down the amenities. We take out the swimming pools. We take out the big giant clubhouses. We incorporate a small sales office and we incorporate amenities of healthy living within the outdoor living area of the multifamily apartment complex that we're building. We give them a class A product, something that they're proud of. That when they walk in, they say, this is home. This is where I live. But yet we can lease that property for a more affordable price and compete with B-plus rents as opposed to A-plus rents in newly built developments with all the amenities because our expenses to run, manage, and facilitate repairs on that property are less than those that have swimming pools, large clubhouses, large amenities that have to be maintained by groundkeepers and third-party companies to be able to do so. So ladies and gentlemen, by being able to do this, this lowers our, lowers our overall expenses, still gives us a really reasonable net operating income, and that net operating income, when calculated into value, still gives us a valuation that is solid for today's real market and affordable living for the end users and tenants. So according to the National Association of Realtors, we have a threshold in a cusp of reason here of that, that says affordability and availability are the two components. How will you structure your professional investment career over the next five to 10 years to take advantage of what the market is bringing to us, strategically find a solution to profit from it and ultimately make long-term gains. If you like this content and want more content just like it, click and subscribe to our YouTube channel, smash that thumbs up button, and ladies and gentlemen, I'll see you next time. For more content just like this, I'm going to recommend a couple videos right after this one. Watch, learn, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.